and welcome to the programme. I'm Nima Abuarde. Gulf governments want to get their people to play a bigger role in their country's economies. Now, this isn't just about job creation. Qatar has started an initiative to get its citizens to invest in the local stock market. So, will its people benefit financially from the country's development? Also coming up this week, taking a cut. Why upmarket food firms want a slice of the Gulf market. It's not really surprising that international companies, especially within premium brands, are actually turning to this region, especially with the economic crisis that happened in Europe and a lot of people are trading down to more uh, mass brands in that part of the world. Tea time. Is golf going to help get Tunisian tourism back on course? Discount dilemma. Can the region's biggest voucher business succeed in Egypt? The restaurant owners or people that own the attractions or whatnot were, were quite happy for us to come into Egypt because they know our brand and they know that we drive business to them. And shining example, we meet the Egyptian jewellery designer who's become a worldwide brand. But first, much of the land here in the Gulf is desert, which means you can't grow enough food to feed the population. In fact, 90% of what's consumed is brought in from abroad, which is great news for importers, especially of luxury items, as Simon Atkinson now reports. Three days ago, this salmon was swimming in the waters of Western Scotland. Now it's being prepared for cooking at an Indian restaurant in a Dubai hotel. Over the past few years, the Middle East has become one of the biggest markets for delicacies like this. Scottish salmon imports have grown from virtually nothing to almost $10 million in the past three years. And it's just one food that's in hot demand here. As you'd probably expect when your main ingredient's been brought in from so far away, this isn't going to be the cheapest meal you'll find. But as well as the Scottish salmon, the restaurants in this hotel also have Wagyu beef from Australia, crabs from Alaska and scallops from New Zealand, all at the top end of the price list. But it's the sort of prices that this business and its customers are prepared to pay. But restaurants say it's not just about the markup these foods allow them to charge. Premium products are very important to us because we have to know where our products are coming from. We have to know that we're getting what we're paying for, especially at the moment where there's a lot of question marks being raised uh, around the world, especially in Europe, with regards to what is actually going into one's food. By tying back the source of where we have gained these products from, that reinforces the fact that we know our product, we know what we're serving, and if necessary, we can back that up. Food imports to the GCC are set to double to $53 billion by 2020. And this week, thousands of food producers from across the world poured into the Gulf trying to scoop up more customers. And while there were plenty of the more basic foods on show, makers of luxury products see this as a real opportunity. With one of the highest disposable incomes in the world, it's not really surprising that international companies, especially within premium brands, are actually turning to this region, especially with the economic crisis that happened in Europe and a lot of people are trading down to more uh, mass brands in that part of the world. International manufacturers are looking towards a new potential market and the GCC definitely spells that out for them. When your home market's struggling, there's an extra incentive to sell overseas. And for countries like Scotland, that means pushing more than just salmon. Scottish produce appeals to high-end markets, to niche markets, uh, markets that are looking for good quality produce. And that's exactly uh, the type of produce that is wanted in uh, the Middle East markets. The tourist business here is booming, the hotels are busy, and they're all looking for something to give themselves a little bit of an edge over their competitors. But it's not just about getting into restaurants. The region's supermarkets are where many luxury products are bought. Sarah's business makes honey with fruit and other ingredients on the family farm in Ireland. They're now selling in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Amman, as well as the UAE, and even have interest from Iran. But it's not proved easy. 
Getting into the market here is extremely difficult. Um, it would take an awful lot longer than, the, than certain markets, say in Europe, and that, that we would be more used to. And also there's huge requirements in terms of documentation, translation. Because it has a perception of having disposable income, um, there are many, many different competitors on shelf. And so you can't just charge what you want. You, know, you still have to come in competitive. But I have to say, if you have the patience um, and you're willing to respect that and, and to do business that way, you will be very happy here. And if honey with fruit isn't sufficiently high-end for you, how about this? More honey, but this time mixed with truffles and gold. The tens of thousands of people at the food show have seen some pretty lavish things this week. But that's one product which really takes the biscuit. Simon Atkinson reporting there. Now, last week, Qatar announced the creation of a 12 billion dollar investment company that will be listed on the local stock market. This comes hot on the heels of another publicly traded company that's involved in infrastructure investment. The idea here is to get Qataris to benefit financially from their country's development. Now, is this a sensible investment strategy or a false boost for a local tiny stock market? That's a question I put to Steve Drake of PricewaterhouseCoopers. To a certain extent, it's about giving the local capital market a boost. It's been very flat, particularly over the last three years, where other than one or two listings, there hasn't really been any companies coming to market. And I know that what Qatar are trying to do is to, is to develop their capital markets much further than they are now. So this is one aspect of that. The other is the launching of a new market, the, the venture market aimed at, at small businesses. So I think steadily they're just trying to reintroduce new ways of how to kickstart the capital market. And Qatar has always said that they want to really take everyone on the journey towards a better life, right? They want to distribute the wealth. Is this it part may of it? well be. I think that's a feature of the region generally, given that there is such natural wealth here that in one way or another governments are a are to a large extent obliged to redistribute that wealth across um, across their economies and across their people and doing that through these kind of investments and also through the stock exchange through the issuance of share capital is one way to do that. I just want to get a feel for how important this is. Is this a big deal? I think it, it's just another statement of intent that Qatar is serious about its own market, it's serious about investing in its future and it's serious about investing in its people. If you look by contrast um, into Saudi, the, the government has announced a $220 billion spend this year. It's largely going to be on infrastructure projects within the kingdom because that's where the need is. In a smaller economy like Qatar, there is less of a need, so they have to be more imaginative as where they make their investments. Now, as things stand, only Qatar is allowed to buy into stocks and shares into companies listed on their local market. When will not just Qatar, but the Gulf really open up to non-nationals, people like you? That's a difficult question to answer at the moment. Quite a lot of the, the, the rationale behind listing in the region is to distribute the wealth across the, the, the national community. Um, and therefore to open that up to, to overseas investors is distributing the wealth outside of the region. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure at the moment that the region is, is ready to do that. So we're probably some time away before we will see the ability to significant uh, overseas investors investing in the local markets. I think they'll stay quite close for the time being. But some, some countries, and Qatar is an example, the UAE is an example, they have opened their markets for overseas companies to list locally. But again, that would just be with local investors investing primarily. So really this is all about nationals, Qataris specifically in Qatar, benefiting from their country's development, from things like the World Cup being hosted there. Yes, I, I, I would say so, yes. Their, their ability to invest more broadly um, and the ability for their local companies to be able to access capital within, within country. Steve Drake of PricewaterhouseCoopers speaking to me earlier to tourism now, which is so vital for Tunisia's economy. The number of people visiting the country fell by 40% in the wake of its revolution. Now, things have picked up, but more help is needed, and some in the industry believe they have the answer, as Jeremy Howell now reports from Tunisia. The Flamingo Golf Club in Monastir is only two hours' drive from Tunis, the capital. But as riots on the streets of Tunis sunk the regime of President Ben Ali, the most important thing for this group of golfers across from France was sinking putts in the amateur competitions. The competitions continued, like the Tunisian Championship. It was considered fine to continue that as normal because the courses were perfectly safe. We didn't know exactly that it was so serious, to be honest with you. 
we were playing. We were supposed to, to leave normally on the 13th. And uh, we left on the 13th. And uh, when, uh, when uh, we were back in Paris, uh, we learned that uh, he left uh, the day after. <laughs> this is it. Jack McCullers and his wife Claire run Golf Tunisia. Their challenge during the days of the uprising was looking after the 300 or so clients who'd booked golf holidays with them. A lot of them obviously cancelled. They were afraid to come, naturally. Others were just waiting to get on a flight. The flights had been cancelled, so they weren't able to get here and they were just waiting to be able to get the first available flights. We also had customers that uh, refused to go home. You know, they had booked for two weeks and they were going to stay for two weeks. That may be a little bit flippant to have been playing golf throughout the revolution, but golf has now become a priority for the tourist industry in this revolutionary country, both to attract tourists and to add to Tunisia's dwindling foreign currency reserves. Golfers spend more money than the average tourist. You can get cheap holidays to Tunisia for $500 easily. Uh, whereas a golf holiday will cost you eight or nine hundred dollars. The golf costs extra, the drinks cost extra, golfers like to drink. Tunisia has a dozen golf courses which North Europeans come to in winter when it's too cold and wet to play at home. To put Tunisia on a par with major winter golf resorts like Spain and Portugal, the government has plans for ten more courses to be built over the next decade. Well, the more golf courses you have, the more golfers you're going to get. But the tourist board needs to do massive publicity outside of Tunisia. The average golfer in the UK doesn't know that Tunisia has golf courses. They know that they have beaches, they know about summer holidays, but they don't know about golf holidays in Tunisia. Um, that, in fact, is our number one obstacle. But with ongoing civil unrest to deal with, the government seems to be overlooking the task of promoting golf tourism. The business may have to spend a little more time in the bunker before chalking up success at the Ministry of Tourism. Jeremy Howell reporting from Tunisia there. Right, we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, we spend the day with one of Egypt's top jewellery designers. Welcome back to the program. I'm Mima Abu Ad. You know, everyone likes a good bargain, and that's why thousands of people across the Gulf are buying books like this. They're full of two for the price of one vouchers for places like hotels, water parks, and restaurants. Now, you can see the appeal in a place like Dubai, where there's lots to do, but why bother with Saudi Arabia? That's a question I put to the company's founder, Donna Benton. Saudi has over 20 million people that live there. Our aim there is for the local market, for the Arabic market. All they pretty much do in Saudi is they shop, they eat and they work. So a lot of our focus is on the business clientele. So we also do two for one um, hotel room nights. And also the other thing with Saudi is they have big families. So actually our average book purchase in Saudi is roughly two to three per family. So Saudi is actually quite a strong market for us. And you also launched in Egypt this year. Very big market for you, I'm sure, but there's been a lot of unrest there. Correct. Egypt was a little different than other countries, obviously because of the unrest. Not a lot of people were going out, their tourism traders dropped. So for us going into a new market like Egypt was uh, not easy because there's a lot of groundwork that goes into it but the restaurant owners or people that own the attractions or whatnot were, were quite happy for us to come into Egypt because they know our brand and they know that we drive business to them. So th there were a few challenges along the way getting to the right people in the unrest <laughs> at the same time for them to get the right decision maker to actually sign everything off. So we're not talking about the corner falafel shop? No. 
we're actually quite selective who also goes into our books because when you're dealing with international brands in all the other regions, every other demographic has to fit with your books. So you have to keep that right brand platform as well where people want to go. You want value for money. You want you want someone to travel 10 minutes or 5 minutes or 15 minutes, you know, out of their way to go and eat at that restaurant. With all of the unrest, with the economy being in trouble, are businesses desperate? They're keen for the business. They want the business, yes. Um, yeah, desperate's a strong word. <laughs> but, um, but look, they, they're not going to knock back the business. But what about competition? There is competition in Egypt. You don't own the idea of two for the price of one. No, we don't. We don't own the two for one, but we certainly own our name and our brand that we have, that we have earned over the last 12 years. It sounds like your business idea is great when times are bad, people want to save money. But what about now? It's said that times are good. I launched the books in 2001. So as you can imagine, as I've put everything into this company in the September 11. So we've been through that, we've been through a Gulf War, and we've been through a recession whereby people lost their jobs, they had to go back to their own countries. So we've been through those tough, tough times, and believe it or not, the recession was the reverse for us. Because everybody wanted to save money, then our book sales went up, and we were actually 40% up that year. Um, on our bottom line be because of that reason. So to be honest, no, everybody still likes value for money. People actually spend more with a voucher. So if you're a restaurant owner, you actually want people to come in with an entertainer voucher than a normal person without a voucher. Now let's see what other business stories are making headlines across the region this week. Egypt's investment minister says talks with the International Monetary Fund will resume in the coming weeks. An agreement for $4.8 billion had almost been in place late last year, but the government delayed it after popular protests over tax hikes. Speaking at a financial investment conference this week, Minister Osama Saad has said the benefits would outweigh the drawbacks and there was no reason why Egyptians should reject the programme. Iraq's state airline has restarted flights to Kuwait this week for the first time since former leader Saddam Hussein invaded the Gulf oil state in 1990. Last year, diplomatic relations improved after Kuwait and Iraq came to a settlement over Gulf War-era debts. Kuwait's state-run airline has not resumed flights to Iraq. Meanwhile, Kuwaiti MPs have proposed raising the minimum wage for nationals to $5,300 per month. The proposed bill, yet to be voted on by Parliament, also suggests banning NGOs and the public sector from hiring foreigners except in more menial jobs to cut unemployment amongst locals. Kuwait has seen regular protests in the past couple of years and a series of rises in pay and benefits. If approved, the minimum salary will be comfortably the highest anywhere in the world, three times that in Luxembourg. Bahrain's national carrier Gulf Air has cut 15% of its staff and four of its loss-making routes since January as part of its restructuring. The carrier said the measures had so far helped reduce its overall costs by over 34%. Gulf Air announced the restructuring late last year after admitting it was suffering from stiff competition from nearby Emirates Airline, Qatar Airways and Ittihad. Now, building up a brand that's known internationally isn't easy, especially when your country is going through the aftermath of a revolution. Well, we meet a woman who's done just that, Egypt's jewellery designer, Azafani. I started as an apprenticeship in Khan Khalili. They were very nice, actually, because I was a woman and it, I was different from them. They helped me with all the things they can help me. Uh, it just happened uh, gradually because I started doing my first uh, exhibition in Cairo and then it was really something because it was different and it was new for the clientele in Cairo. And uh, uh, then I need another one, another person to help me in doing the things which was taking a lot of time from me. And then I, after a while, I have two, another two, and another two, and another two. And then I, I need to, to hire a bigger place. And then business grow and grow and grow and grow. Till now we have a factory of 200 people in it. Being a woman, it's not easy to, to start a business and you have a family because you know you are responsible, especially in this area. You are the one responsible for the, the kids and, the, and the, you know, the house and the food and, and every responsibility in the house. But this was, I think, one of the, the, the heavy loads.
I have two daughters. I, they are working now in the company. Since was they are very young, they are helping me in the business, which is, which is uh, was very good. That's the start, like we said in Arabic, uh, drinking the business. <laughs> you know, this is an expression, and they love it, and they decided they want to be in this business. Huh? the flow of the line. This understanding between east and west. It's important. What's the market needs here, and what's the market from there needs from me? And when the companies grows, we have consultant, we have things which really this company is good and needs to be be international. So we work towards that. I mean, helping the quality of the work, helping uh, the quality of the uh, of, uh, marketing, the quality of the shooting, the quality of everything since 10 years. Now we start, to, I mean, preparing ourselves psychologically and technically and supportedly by, by experts to go international. It's, I think my company is a company with stages, I mean, between when, when, I, when I start the idea and, and the product is finished. It's really each, each product has uh, a story behind it. Uh, I mean the the quality. It's uh, the quality of the of uh, of the work, the quality, the training we gave to the people, to to the, the understanding between uh, people uh, among each others. Uh, all that I think reflect the passion, which if the if you don't do uh, your work with this passion and with this depth, it w won't be the same thing. <laughs> I think that the, the energy is there, but you have to, to guide it. A lot of people, they feel there is a, a change in Kair. Either they are with it or without the change, but it's not the same situa uh, society which was before. But I think it was a good opportunity because I have this in my mind to start uh, things which can help these young people. So we thought of Nubre, it's an institute it's a studio, design studio, for a product designer. We start with jewelry, and then we'll move to other things. The story of Egypt, Azza Fahmi. Well, our time is very nearly up for this week. I do hope you've enjoyed our program. Before we go, let's see how the region's main markets performed. And remember, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. And you can go to Twitter and Facebook for latest photos and news from our teams across the world. Now, next week, we're in Iraq. It's 10 years since the US-led invasion. And a decade on, the country is still struggling. So what successes has Iraq seen and what challenges still remain? Until then, from me, Nima Abuwarde, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.